This presentation is about the unique contributions made by Alan Watts to 20th century Buddhism and psychology. There were a number of late 19th century thinkers who believed Buddhism could make a meaningful contribution to psychology. Some of those thinkers included uh, Thoreau and Emerson, the transcendentalists, Carolyn Reyes Davis, a uh, linguist and Poly translator, Paul Karras, a philosopher and theologian, and of course, William James. The field responded by conceiving of therapy as both a means of treating serious mental illness and by also responding to the causes of patients' spiritual emptiness, anxiety, and alienation. The interest in Eastern spirituality gradually moved from the intellectual fringes to become highly influential in how Western psychology conceptualized the self-consciousness and the cause of human suffering. So how did Buddhist teachings come West? Well, it was the work of radical thinkers like those who founded the Theosophical Society and individual converts who requested teaching from Buddhist teachers For almost a hundred years, between 1893 and the 1970s, there was a steady influx of Buddhist monks, teachers, and translators. D.T. Suzuki became one of the most influential translators of the late 19th, early 20th century. His career spanned nearly 60 years and he is widely regarded as one of the founders of Zen in the West. One Westerner inspired by Suzuki was Ruth Fuller Everett Suzaki. She became the first woman to become a Zen sensei and head priest of a Japanese temple. She lived in Kyoto until her death in 1967, and she is well known for her translations of original Buddhist texts. She is also the mother-in-law of our subject for this talk, Alan Watts. Something that was unique about D.T. Suzuki is that he really understood the Western mind. More than any other teacher before him, he recognized that what Buddhism and psychoanalytic theory had in common was a view that unconscious forces cause much of human suffering and the shared idea that one may gain insight into these thought processes through various practices. Suzuki sought out and collaborated with Carl Jung, Karen Hornet, Eric Fromm, Father Thomas Merton, Nina Coltart, and many others, such as Christmas Humphreys, Beatrice Lane, Harold Kleeman, Abraham Maslow, Gregory Bateson, R.D. Lang, and Alan Watts. Suzuki's interactions with psychology led to a psychologization of Buddhism in the West. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Buddhist teachers from numerous traditions established learning centers throughout the United States. Students of Geshe Wangel, Shunra Suzuki, Taizan Mezumi, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, and the Dalai Lama have been responsible for the proliferation of Buddhist texts, translations, and practices throughout the United States. One of the most important philosophers and popularizers of Buddhist thought during this time period was Alan Watts. Like Suzuki, Alan Watts was curious about how Western philosophy, religion, and psychology might be informed by Zen Buddhism. What made Watts unique was that he was the only teacher of his time to use the multimedia available to him to demonstrate 
to disseminate Buddhist ideas widely to the public. For his entire life, Watts was a person who questioned the status quo and delighted in challenging others to question it as well, and he did that in a very public way. Watts's own journey through Eastern thought really illustrates the zeitgeist of his day, and his life story provides us insight into how Buddhism has had such a significant influence on psychology historically, and even more so today. Watts was born in Kent, England in 1915. Even though his family was relatively poor, he attended good schools and he was considered an excellent student at the top of his class. One thing that was unusual about him is that at a very young age, he, can, he declared that he was a Buddhist and a pacifist. Although his mother was a Christian, he and his father joined the Theosophical Society and the first lay Buddhist society in Europe, founded by his mentor, Christmas Humphreys. Although he was rejected by Oxford University and didn't attend college right away, Watts was more interested in continuing with his Buddhist studies, including study with Didi Suzuki. Additionally, he read widely in the fields of philosophy, history, psychology, and psychi psychiatry and Eastern religion. In the mid 1930s, Watts began regular publishing of works in Buddhist psychology and philosophy. In 1938, Watts and his wife moved to America where he enrolled in Seabury Western Theological Seminary. After graduating from seminary, Watts served as the Episcopal Chaplain at Northwestern University for five years. It was during this period that he wrote numerous books on Christian mysticism. Behold the Spirit is one of his books and is a discussion of contemporary Christianity and emphasize the importance of union with God rather than knowledge of doctrine. And this book is considered a classic in Christian literature. In 1947, Watts left the priesthood and accepted uh, his first teaching position at the American Academy of Asian Studies in San Francisco. He remained at the academy until 1953, where he taught classes and later became the academy director. This was one of Watts' most productive periods and laid the groundwork for Watts' success as a freelance philosopher. Between 1953 and 1968, Watts worked as a freelance philosopher, lecturer, author and host of a weekly broadcast on Pacifica Radio outside of Berkeley until 1963. This was an important period for Watts. He wrote two of his most important works, The Way of Zen in 1957 and Psychotherapy East and West in 1961. The Way of Zen was one of the first best-selling books on Buddhism in the United States. It was a work that introduced an entire generation of the 1960s youth culture to Eastern philosophy and psychology. Philosophy, I'm sorry, Psychotherapy East and West was a work in which Watts proposed that Buddhism could be thought of as a form of psychotherapy rather than a religion. In some of his other works, Watts explored humanity's relationship with the natural world, human consciousness, and ecofeminism.
Also during this time, he became professor of comparative philosophy at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He also received a fellowship uh, to be at Harvard University between 1962 and 64, and was a scholar in residence at San Jose State University in 1968. During this period, he also gained a large following in the San Francisco Bay Area during his years at Pacifica Public Radio. His talks and broadcasts can be found on the internet, and many public radio stations replay them to this day. Although D.T. Suzuki and his collaborators were the first to bring Buddhism and Western psychology together in significant ways, Watts played a leading role in popularizing Buddhism until his death in 1973. He was responsible in a major way for psychologizing Western Buddhism and recognizing the value of such an integration. Watts's clear and relatable exposition of Zen resonated with the Western psyche. His work began the integration of Asian thought and Western psychotherapy that is still underway today. His premise in psychotherapy East and West was that Eastern ways of liberation have more in common with psychotherapy than with Western religion, and that therapy and spiritual practice share a similar technique, which he called the counter game. They both allow the practitioner to act on his delusions until he backs himself into a corner and sees through them. At the end of his life, Watts became critical of one subject in psychology in particular, the ego. He believed psychology mistakenly promoted the existence of the ego as a separate, permanent, and real thing. Watts believed that deconstructing ego was the work of the meditator. His ideas about what a sense of self is were ahead of his time and are only now gaining traction in Western psychology. A few of the areas where Watts felt Buddhism and Western psychology were most compatible were in descriptive phenomenology, in making psychotherapeutic meaning and in pure clinical utility. Watts also vigorously promoted the potential of mindfulness for bringing awareness to the misguided human activity of constructing that sense of an independent, separate, permanent sense of self or ego. Watts had its critics. Buddhists and academics criticized him for not being formal enough in either of those disciplines. Watts has also been criticized for overly psychologizing Buddhism in the West and diluting its practice. For good or bad, the written work and audio and video recordings made by Watts remain relevant and meaningful to this day. The work of Alan Watts influenced many areas of Western scholarship, but, is it, but it is his contribution to the integration of Buddhism into Western psychology that has been his most significant and meaningful contribution. The final slides have links to resources for you to explore the work of Alan Watts for yourself.